Welcome to the final hour of our lovely listener special. It was, in fact, the brainchild of Pete and Acton. He didn't know that he was going to be inventing a programme, but he was. This is what he sent us. He said, Vanessa, the passing of Joan from Wallington has really upset me because for years, via the radio, she's been one of those very regular callers to many of the shows. It's sad news indeed that she has passed away. I was always so interested in what she had to say on an enormous variety of subjects. And then Pete continues, what radio creates is what can only be described as an extended family, which is something that television can never do. And he sent his condolences to her family and to her friends. And that's really what gave us the idea for this programme. And that's why we decided to, to call the last hour of it um, Why I Love Radio. And we thought we'd kick off with Frank Gardner. He's uh, the BBC's security correspondent. He works across both radio and television. But I know, Frank, welcome, that, that radio has a particularly special place in your heart. Can you explain why? Probably because radio was the first medium that put me on air, I think, um, that would take me. Um, so I didn't actually get a no from television, but, um, but I, I went to Oman and um, I witnessed an exorcism, which was really extraordinary. It was out in the desert in the Wahiba Sands. And um, I knew that the, I just started the BBC, this was about nearly 20 years ago, and there was a program, or there is a program, a fantastic program called From Our Own Correspondent on Radio 4. Yes. And I thought, well, this would be a great one to write up. It's, it's known by its acronym as a FOOC, F O O C, <laughs> and uh, moving swiftly on. Um, so, um, anyhow, I, I was amazed. The editor, um, Tony Grant, said, yep, we'll take that. And I'm like, yes, amazing. You know, and I hadn't had any training at all, but I just simply wrote it up almost as a kind of oral travel piece. And I think, in some ways, in foreign news reporting, the best radio is rather like travel writing. You're putting the listener where you are. Yes. You're getting them to walk in your footsteps, or in my case, roll in my ruts. Um, so, and the grooves made by my wheelchair. But it, it just, it, it takes you there, transports you. And I very much tried to break away from the formulaic thing of clip, you know, narrative, clip, narrative. You know, keep some sound running under. You know, let's hear what it's like to have that stream there or the gunfire in the distance or the call to prayer or the traffic noise or whatever. And one of the most fun bits of radio I've ever done was when a producer from Radio 3 said, look, we've got a 20-minute gap in the middle of Verdi's Aida. Why don't you tell us about your recollections of living in Cairo? And I said, I've got a better idea. Why don't we go to Cairo and do this? Yes. These were in the days when the BBC had money to spend on this kind of thing. So, um, so off we went for 24 hours, and we just did 24 hours in Cairo, the traffic, the crashes, uh, you know, the belly dancing, the music, the, the, the vibrancy of it all, the chit-chat, the hubbly bubblies and it was all there compacted into this sort of 20 minutes. Um, heaven knows what the li good listeners of Radio 3 who thought they were going to tune into Verdi's Aida made of it, but, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. And, and do you think radio is more fun than television? Um, I really like working at the BBC, so if you want me to put my, you know, nail my colours yes, to I one do. Nail the your other, colours to the I'm going to get some it. dark looks when I go back in the newsroom. We heard what you said on Feltz. We didn't like it. <laughs> you know, the director will see you now. No, I, I mean, they, they've both got their own merits. I think radio, radio requires a bit more, I think, from... It, it requires a bit more thinking, because good television, you let the pictures do the talking. And I, I just think that the less we hear from the correspondent in some ways... If you're, if you're wording, if you're voicing over pictures that you're seeing, if you've got a good camera person and it's well edited, you really don't need to say very much. Radio, you've got to dig deep and come up with a lot more and explain a lot more to people without being patronising. You know, and you don't want to do the kind of Lord Privy Seal. You know, if there's gunfire going on in the background, you don't want to say, well, we've just heard gunfire. Well, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. But who's doing the shooting? What are they shooting at? Why are they doing it? You know, that's the challenge of radio. Well, what do you make of what our lovely listener, Peter Acton, said about family, about a kind of intimacy about radio, which somehow rather, I think some people think, surpasses um, television? I mean, you hear about television, oh, you're a guest in my living room, I see your face in my living room, after I've done a bit of TV myself over the years, haven't I? And I, I know that people say that. But I think the, the, the warmth and the depth of the connection would seem to be of a different quality and calibre, I think. Definitely. I mean, the amount of people who say, you know, I've woken up with Vanessa Feltz or, you know... <laughs> Don't tell um, anyone about that. Don't tell anyone. Um, <laughs> and then there's your radio shows. Um, <laughs> the, the, the amount of people, you know, and, and I get this, you know, um, great to wake up, or perhaps not great to wake up to, you know, because I'm usually having to do bad news, you know, unfortunately, you yes. know, in security and terrorism and stuff. But, but you're right. I mean, it, you, you're placed right there in 
the breakfast room, you know, as people are getting ready to go to school or on a school run or they listen to you on a podcast um, or in the evening. It's the last thing, you know, probably I've lost count of the number of people I've sent to sleep. Um, <laughs> you know, um, but, but you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's got that intimacy that it completely fills the room in a way that I think television doesn't necessarily because you're strug- with TV, you're struggling between do I listen to what's being said or do I watch the pictures? And we can't always cope with both at the same time. Let's bring in Petro Trelawney of Radio 3. It's so nice to see you. You've, you've had a, a, and will continue to have a long and distinguished career in, in radio. Can you talk about the place it occupies in, in your heart and why? Well, I, I think very much what, what Frank was saying about, A, that ability to paint pictures, just to rely on words and communication rather than the, the fancy ingredients that, that go into television. But I think also that business of absolutely direct communication, yes. you know, almost one-on-one communication. I remember my first job was working down in Exeter at BBC Radio Devon and I presented a morning program there. We had a fantastic tough Liverpudlian editor a guy called Roy Corlett who'd come up through weekly newspapers, regional newspapers, the national press but had decided the thing he really wanted to do at the end was to run a really good radio station. And the first piece of advice he gave me was you're talking to one person Imagine who that person is, if you want. Think of, you know, the lady in Budley Salterton or the, the, the man in Plymouth or whatever. But don't think of it as being a broadcast where you're throwing these words out and they're kind of gently falling down on lots of people. Think of it as being a direct form of communication. Well, that's why, that's, I, say, stuck with. that's why I say lovely listener. And some people just don't get it. You have guests who come in and go, oh, yes, the lovely listeners. And it's no, uh, no, no it's not funny, plural. Well, Good morning, lovely listener. You, not everyone, just you, the only person I'm talking to talking to that is the whole point of lovely listener it's just one listener and when That's someone it. talks about the plural sometimes it completely yeah, breaks it ruins the whole magic it completely of it, it? no not your lovely listeners vanessa that's not it you don't get it at all you just don't twig it that's absolutely right the talking to one person let's bring alex lester into this my colleague at radio too it's so nice to see you it's lovely to see you lovely to see you and and you know for for how many years were you the dark lord of the middle uh, of the night probably about tw- about 26 years but i think i'm just so much older than everybody else this day <laughs> these days so you know frank's you know cut his teeth in Cairo and yeah. the Petrov was in I was in a hull. <laughs> Stop I've boasting. Been to hull. Now I'm, you're showing off. Yeah, really and showing it was, off. again, and you're talking about family and BBC Radio Humberside, which still is a pillar of the community. Yeah. And I got sent, I'm from Walsall in the West Midlands, you know, I got sent to Hull, my first BBC outpost. I had to look it up on the map to find out where it was, genuinely. And I turned up, it was at the end of the M62, just before you drop into the sea. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a totally different country. It was fantastic. The accents were amazing, mm. and they had a particular sense of community, so therefore the radio station was the focus of that. And they had the most bizarre programmes, but they were still number one in the market by a long way, ahead of the Radio One and all those stations at the time. One of the most bizarre ones I particularly remember was a guy who used to play the organ at lunchtimes once a week. <laughs> and he was a club organist. Right? They still had a lot of working men's clubs back in the late 70s, early 80s. And we didn't have enough microphones and things, so therefore his voice microphone had to be left switched on while he was playing the organ. <laughs> and he'd have elderly ladies mainly on the phone going, Oh, could you play Pal of McCradle Days? <laughs> and, he'd go, and he didn't know many tunes. He'd go, I tell you what, let's have silver threads among the gold instead, shall we? <laughs> and he'd do this, and he'd start playing. And you hear those wonderful club organs. Da, 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 da. And you heard this voice on the telephone going, oh, silver threads among the gold. <laughs> Meanwhile, you could hear this... <gasps> Because the poor bloke had a 90-a-day habit. So, therefore, you had this wheezing going on. But it was still... Everybody tuned in to listen to it, because it was, it was just... It was there, and it was part of what we did in this area. It's brilliant to have you, Alex. Honestly, it's lovely to have you all here. Frank Gardner's going to have to go. I know he's going probably to the alien uh, um, tribe of television straight after this. So, thank you very much indeed. We're going to take a trail, and straight after it, we'd love to hear from you, lovely listener. And I mean everybody here today uh, in, in, in the council chamber, and also everybody listening, wherever you are, know you're never going to going to make the sprouts taste any cop. It doesn't matter if you fry them gently with lardon or bacon. They're still going to be horrible. Everyone hates them. Um, 0207 224 2000. Why you love radio. That's coming up straight after this. BBC London 94.9. You guys haven't got the greatest reputation and one imagines that anybody avoids paying for something would be hailed and lauded by your type and not punished. Eddie Nestor's drive time. I'm a bit strong. That's I apologise. Massive generalisation. <laughs> <laughs> Weekdays from five. In 2050, we're bringing in the these rules that will change it forever. You'll be able to see a GP, your children will be able to get into school. Don't worry, Dave, you're safe with us. And all I'm going to say to him, Eddie, is tell me what your plan is. Eddie <laughs> Nestor's Drive Time.
behind me are, I'm different to you. I don't like the fact that he ain't living here and paying taxes like me and you. And I would have gone for Joe Payne. Well, you know, you had an opportunity to you vote. <laughs> well done. So we're talking about why I love radio, and I know that lots of uh, lovely listeners here have got lots to say, including the ones who've been silent all these years and are suddenly finding a voice, which is marvellous. Hello there. Can you say who you are? Hello, Vanessa. I'm Norma from West Wickham. Norma, brilliant to see you. And I love the radio because for a long time I was in hospital and I had double vision. And so the only thing I could do was listen to the radio. I'm very nervous. I'm so <laughs> You're sorry. You're doing brilliantly. Yeah. You don't and sound so the nervous. The only thing you I could fab. do was listen to the radio. And I listened to The Archers. Yeah. I listened to yourself Hooray. and the lovely Robert Elms. <laughs> You'll see him in a minute. Don't get too excited. He's coming in. And so that's why I love radio. Why? What was it like, though? You were obviously not well. Well, I wasn't at all well, you yeah. know, so um, I couldn't really see a lot. So it was just about what I could hear, you know, and that just meant so much to me. I even listened to the radio on the, you know, the local... Yes. In the hospital radio. Oh, the local hospital radio yeah. as well. Yeah. And, and, and what, what, did it, what did it mean? It sort of linked to the outside world and just definitely hearing what was. everybody else it was definitely doing? It was, and, yes. Yeah. Um, because it can be very isolating being in hospital. It can, it can. You feel as yeah. if you're completely out of the swim, especially if you can't read a paper or you can't no, see well enough no. to look on the internet or whatever it is. It must have been, it could, could be quite sort yes, of lonely exactly. and frightening. And, you know, it just, took, to, just takes you to other places. And also listening to the stories on the radio, yeah. just, yeah, it just brings you do, back Do you, to you ever find place. when you're listening to my programme that you think you know what you think at the beginning of the programme? <laughs> and an hour really later you think something completely different? Totally. Yeah, totally. so do I. Yeah. And, and isn't that one of the best things about it, though? Mm. Don't you think? Yes, now this is Delma. Delma, uh, from, go on from, then. From, She's from, so um, quiet, Delma. She never Crystal says Crystal Palace, yeah. Crystal Palace. Um, the, the thing that I was going to say, like what you've just said, I have an opinion, yeah. and then I think, wow, that's really good, and then somebody will say, say something else, and yeah. I think, well, I'll agree with that as well. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps going and it keeps going. And don't you think, though, that, that isn't it true that the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensities? In other words, the the older you get, the more entrenched in your views, Petrock, you can become. Absolutely. And there's something magnificent about changing your mind when you get to a certain age and having yes, your or, mind changed for you. Or even if you don't actually change it in the end, just kind of listening long enough to someone persuasive that you might go to a, a slightly different viewpoint before you come back, come back to home. But I also think what, what you were saying about listening in hospital and things, I mean, I noticed particularly at this time of year, you know, Christmas is a time of joy for many people. Yes. It's also a horrible time for lots of people who realise that, you know, life's not great for whatever reason. And it's a time when people can feel incredibly lonely as well as incredibly loved. And you pick that up from the sort of responses I get on Radio 3, for yes. example. People writing in and saying, look, please could you play this particular piece of music because it reminds me of a, a partner who died or it reminds me of a terrible moment in my life. And they want to sort of celebrate that person through, through music. But yes. it's that wonderful way of, of, of sort of unifying people and saying, actually, you're not alone. We're all, we're all in this mad world together, which I don't think you get through TV. You don't get it through newspapers. Maybe you get it a bit now through social media, mm. I, I, but you certainly get it through the radio. I also think that television, and, uh, insofar as I've, I've, I've been on it, is very, very prescribed. I mean, you know, you've got your guests booked out for the first 15 minutes, and they are your guests, and they're there in the studio. You're, you're dressed in a certain way, standing in a certain position where the camera dictates, asking a person. And often, when I've been on telly since doing radio, I think, God, if they were on my radio show, I wouldn't have them on for more than seven seconds. Or, 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 and you have to you, talk to them for the whole 15 minutes. Or you, you, just, think, get, ah, you is... just get to the interesting point, and the producer says, wrap up, exactly. you know, and, and you've yeah. got no control over it. Yes, it's, I mean, the radio is a very different matter. Let's, let's talk to Paul. Hi, Vanessa. L listening to the lovely Delma from Crystal Palace and Vanessa... Uh, sorry, Norma, Norma from uh, West Wickham. I'm yeah. their local minicab driver, actually. Though I may well have had them in my cab. <laughs> uh, look, looking at them, I'd love to as well. Um, but I, I do a 12-hour shift, so I, you know, basically my car radio doesn't move from the dial BBC London. Hooray. I mean, you know, Frank used the terms vibrancy and in intimacy. Peter Acton said family, and you've mentioned warmth. All of, all of those things. I mean, you know, 7.30, you've got Paul and Penny keeping your seat warm. Uh, it's an embarrassment of riches. You know, you've got Rob. Robert's got no rivals That's between true. noon and three. Joe Good has a perfect magazine show at three. And Simon, later on at ten, is a supremely gifted journalist and broadcaster. So, you know, it's, it's the best show on... on in, in, well, it, it's the best station in the UK. Oh, we only, gave, Without, him, we only yeah. gave him a croissant to make him say that. That's all it was. That's very kind of you to say. I appreciate it. Thank you 
Thank you very much indeed. I mean, Alex, in the middle of the night as the Dark Lord, you built up this... I mean, would you, do you think it's, it's romanticising to say family? What would you call a, it's it? A big, it's a big family. Uh, because of... Uh, I used to do a show, I don't know, you know, which ran from 2 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock in the morning, five mornings a week, Monday to Friday. I'd move the weekends now. But that was... And I did that for about 25 years. And over that period of time, you do get to know people and they get to know you. Mm. And they are family. And I remember the best, one of the nicest things anyone said, a lot of truck drivers were saying, it was like having a mate in the cab. Mm, that's right. And that's the thing, we would talk about stuff. I'd play music, but apart from that, it was a bit like having a pub conversation. So we'd talk about stuff, and gradually over the period of years, obviously, social media arrived, and we, started, had, to, you know, we had text, we had facts, and then email, and that sort of stuff. And so we get a lot of things in. And then people, we had, uh, you know, people could send photographs in electronically and things like that. And so therefore, the nature of the programme changed, and it became a lot more interactive. And that was wonderful as well. So, rather like you were saying, you'd start off with an idea of what you were going to do. But you, as the audience, would go... Well, we're not having none of this. Yeah. We're going to do this instead. And so, therefore, you'd completely ignore what I was saying and go off into tangents. Go, all right, fine enough. You've hijacked the show again. We'll do that instead. Yes. And because it was a time of night, it was a rather bizarre time of night, we could do all sorts of things. We invented two entirely new countries over a period of 25 years. <laughs> Why not? Uh, we uh, had um, even got a, a, a fridge because I accidentally stabbed my fridge to death one night while trying to defrost it, and of course that became a story, and so therefore uh, people started to send in woolen fridges. <laughs> Frida, the woolen fridge of doom. You know, all this sort of stuff. And these weren't my ideas, they were your ideas, because it was your show. And this is what I, I loved about it so much, and in fact it's just, it's just knowing that you can... It's your imagination. Imagination uh, works so much better than pictures as such. It's rather like when you... Uh, I remember... Do you remember The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy on yes. Radio 4? Yes. When it came out in the late 70s, early years, I remember I would actually sit in my car because I had a stereo radio in my car and I could hear all the wonderful sound effects that the amazing BBC engineers had done and I made a picture of all the cast members. Then it was shown on television, which was terrible. <laughs> and then they made a film. And that was terrible too, because it wasn't the, the characters didn't look like the characters that they, they they weren't the right characters. They weren't the ones in my head, certainly. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because there's all this controversy around at the moment about the archers, who are having a bit of a revamp, and that's meant that they've changed quite a few of the actors. And I was listening to it yesterday morning. Pip's come back from university, and it's a different Pip. Okay. And she suddenly got five times posher and rather grander. Now maybe she's been on some social elevation course in her first term at university. Who knows? But actually. No, it's a different actor. It's a different Tom. It's a, all these characters changing. And I'm kind of a little hurt by this. I sort of think, you know, you can't pull the wool over my eyes that easily. <laughs> well, let's, let's that, we, oh, Alex, one second. We'll just, we'll, we'll just yeah. go on the phone to Anna in Maidenhead. Hello, Anna. Morning to you. Oh, hi, Vanessa. I'm absolutely gutted because I was meant to be there with you today. Oh, what a shame you're not here. I know. I was in hospital last night with my daughter, bless her, who was very unwell. Oh. Um, we had to go in with a suspected appendicitis, but... Um, She's back out now, oh, so good. that's a good thing. Yes. Um, but yes, I just wanted to say how much I love radio. And, and I think it's been mentioned before, it is such a, an intimate medium. You know, you don't have the paraphernalia you get with the television. Um, there's a voice and there's a listener. And if we're very lucky, it's a particularly lovely and mellifluous voice like yours, Vanessa. Oh, and, goodness um, me, thank you. You know, I think we have... We're so lucky in this country to have the BBC because the standard of broadcasting um, generally across all the BBC stations is very good. But even within that sort of crown of broadcasting, there is a particular jewel that stands out. And it is, it is your 94.9 FM. Oh and I gosh. think you and Robert are the dream team of daytime radio, quite well, honestly. Well, you're saying all the right things. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Very kind. Thank you very much. This is from Leah in, uh, in Mill Hill. And Leah says, I love the radio because it talks to me, which is a pretty simple well, exactly. explanation. She says, uh, I don't have to sit in one place and watch like I have to do with TV. I can get on with household chores. I can shout. I can disagree with the radio or I can agree with the broadcast and my imagination can take off. And she says, mostly I love your programme and also Robert Elms's programme. It's very interesting that call you just had there because, yeah. in fact, she started the conversation because obviously uh, Vanessa is a friend of hers. And she, she started by saying, Oh, but yeah, couldn't, sorry, I'd love to be there, couldn't make it because unfortunately I was with my daughter in hospital last night. You know, it's not the sort of thing you go into the post office and do necessarily, is it? Or you talk to the bank manager saying, Sorry, I've got to be. it's just 
a friend on the radio becomes part of the family, as well as you're our family, you know, we're all in it together, so to speak, really. I mean, my favourite calls definitely are calls which don't sound like radio broadcasts. So, for example, Maureen in Plaster will ring up and she'll say, she'll say, oh, hi, Vanessa, well, you know, Fred's, Fred's in the kitchen, that's Fred there. I mean, I've never had the pleasure of seeing him before, but he's lovely and he's there. She said, well, Fred, Fred told me... You know, I shouldn't phone you and say this, but I'm just going to say, you know, this is what happened when we were courting in this particular alley, in this particular... You know, half the time I'm absolutely horrified. The rest of me is like, God, what happened? And this is her daughter there who has to hear all this stuff, Jackie. Um, and, 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 but I love it when, when the call is like an actual conversation with a real person, not somebody phoning, this is what I think about the EU, and my view on OPEC is this and this. That's fine, but it's quite, quite clinical and sterile and whatever. The, the, the best calls are when people are really talking to you, and, then, and they don't seem to have their best radio voice on or a prepared speech it's just how they really feel and and then you do get to know what their granddaughter's name is and 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 who and how they, and it, it's to me those are the calls that i that i love best and i, and I think that that epitomizes the spontaneity of radio as well doesn't yes. it i mean bits of television are live the news is live and maybe the strictly finals live but everything that bbc london does is live you know 80 percent of what we do on radio three is live pretty much all of radio two is live it's sitting there there's someone sitting there who you know i woke up this morning cursing the fact that i I'd had lunch with my niece on Friday who'd got the flu and I'd picked up her cough oh, and I was no. sort of, you know, that whole kind of sense of it's of the moment. And now I wish I hadn't kissed that. you so effusively when you came in. That was a big miss. Because isn't it the worst thing for a radio broadcaster is a cough? Well, I you don't know. Also, it makes the voice sound amazing. But you can't cough attractively. I've really tried over the years to get a good cough going. It's like a sexy kind of cough with a hint of mischief. <laughs> and you can't. A cough is a shocking the thing. technology always used to be that you had a cough button. Yes, you do. BBC yeah, London, I have a cough button. Radio cough 2, button. I don't have a cough button. No, a cough button. I can remember working at uh, Radio Birmingham, yes. as it was back then, in the late 70s, and we had a newsreader who was wonderful. He was, he'd been ex-World Service, and so therefore he wore a pinstripe suit and was very much the old-fashioned BBC, very much dignity, always with dignity. <laughs> and uh, just as the news jingle was played before he started you know, with stentorian tones, he pressed the cough button and had the most disgusting <laughs> liquid cough and clearing the throat, Ugh. and realised in his headphones that this actually sounded rather louder than he expected it to be, and picked up this box with the button on to find it actually wasn't plugged into anything <laughs> at all. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about coughing is you can cough, with, with the cough button, which I do have normally at BBC London, you can cough as long as somebody else is talking. Push your cough button and cough. You can't obviously cough when you're talking, because if you're talking, silence ensues. So occasionally I have to say, and now I'm going to cough, push the button, cough, and then you hear nothing and a horrible dead air thing, which must be hideous. But is it better? Presumably, I'm, I'm assuming it's better than the cough, is it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But it's still weird. Though, isn't it? Because it is faking it. You know, we're yeah. talking about yeah. the reality of radio. Yeah. So why are we suddenly faking it when it comes? You wouldn't think twice about kind of looking away if you were chatting yeah. to someone and, and coughing. Really but in radio, we worry well, about you it. Because you feel really as if you're just responsible for coughing right into someone's ear. Yeah. It? It's horrible, isn't it? Well, it, again, you know, do you, when you're having a conversation, this is a conversation we're having here, yes. is when you have a conversation with somebody, do you lapse into all sorts of bizarre things that you think that the BBC does? You know, so therefore, you know, what's the time? Well, it's frankly, it's 25 big minutes after 11 at the moment. Did you yeah. know that? You know, and sort of, uh, well, I think I had a cough. <coughs> Pardon me. You know, you just <laughs> cough, don't you? Usually, sorry, you know, a bit of a cold or something like that. And you get on with it. Yes. Are you I think we're for... a lot more relaxed now about the radio than we used to be. Are you prepared for some kind of riot to ensue? Because I'm about to say something that I have been warned is going to provoke a real reaction in everybody in this room. So are you ready? OK, do you know who's just walked into the room? <laughs> Robert Elms is here. Robert Elms has joined us. And he's coming in, and we're going to have a jolly good chat um, with Robert after uh, the, the, the news headlines at 10.30. But since you're here with about one minute to spare, Robert, I mean, people have been talking about you all morning. This is what happens to me. Every, as I've said a million times, every time I get to a London cab, everybody says, you're that Vanessa, aren't you? To which I reply, yes. And then they say, I really love that Robert Elms. That happens to me every <laughs> single time. Um, Robert, you know, people have called you, you know, the non you you're, you're beyond compare. That's what people keep saying about you this morning. People are always talking about me beyond my back. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's lovely to hear, and I think it's because radio is such an intimate medium that you genuinely develop a relationship, and the relationship is two-way. It isn't, it's not a celebrity as an audience, it doesn't work like that. We're kind of in it together. That might sound 
That's certainly how it feels at our end, I think. Well, obviously, we need the listener, otherwise it's a bit dumb where we are if they don't call it, isn't it? <laughs> so it's not some joke thing that I we're pleased I suspect you and I could both talk in a vacuum. On our, but we, yeah, but we don't want to have No, you to. definitely don't want to. And I think it is that relationship between audience and listeners that makes radio so very special. And also makes it so very modern, I think, because it goes wherever you are and it adapts to whatever you do. And, and unlike television, which you have to sit there and be entertained by and you're kind of passive, radio is a, is a, is a process between between two sides, yeah, if you like. Yeah. And, and it's, I know, I love it. So do I. All right, we've got to go to the news headlines. Then Robert will do what he normally does, which is say what's coming up on his show. And, uh, and then we have a conversation. And one of the listeners, Robert, said, Robert, do you, he said, sometimes you talk to Robert about whatever you've just been talking about, and sometimes you don't. Is that because Robert says he doesn't want to talk about it and whispers under his breath? We'll, we'll give you the true answer to that after the news headlines. <laughs> Good morning. A former Conservative children's minister says it would be disrespectful and a mistake for the Home Secretary to scrap the panel of experts assisting the public inquiry into allegations of historical child abuse. Dozens of abuse survivors and child protection experts have welcomed signs that Theresa May is planning to scrap the panel, but Tim Lawton says it would be the wrong move. A survey carried out by Labour suggests three quarters of councils are either switching off or dimming streetlights late at night to save money. The party says it's because of cuts to council funding and it increases the risk of crime and road accidents. But the Conservatives say it's up to councils and communities to decide how much lighting there should be. A planned two-day strike by baggage handlers at Heathrow and Gatwick has been suspended after their employer made them a new pay offer. Members of the Unite Union, who work for Dinata, were due to walk out tomorrow and on Christmas Eve, but they'll now be balloted again. Meanwhile, London-based cabin crew at Japan Airlines have rejected a pay offer, raising the threat of industrial action. The BBC's learnt secret talks have been taking place about the future of Sepp Blatter, the president of football's world governing body FIFA. Mr Blatter, who's 78, has indicated he is likely to run for a fifth term next year, but sources inside FIFA say he may choose to stand aside. And Boris Johnson's used his column in the Daily Telegraph to call on Sony and America to come to their senses and release the comedy about a plot to assassinate North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un. Sony cancelled the planned Christmas Day release of the interview when all the major US cinema chains refused to show it following threats from hackers. But the mayor's called on Sony and the US to get a grip, have some guts, rediscover the spirit of John Wayne and give us the Hollywood ending that free speech demands. London's weather, similar to yesterday, windy and mostly cloudy, just a few brighter intervals, but also the odd patch of drizzle and highs of 12 Celsius, 54 Fahrenheit. <laughs> BBC London 94.9 Travel News. We had a fairly uh, quiet start to Monday, but things are starting to look busier. The M25 queuing both ways to the Dartford crossing now. Uh, we've also had reports of an accident on the M25 clockwise between 12 for the M3 and Staten's at 13. Three cars involved, one lane blocked and traffic building up through there. Wembley, the high road, the A404 is blocked westbound between Ealing Road and Ranella Road due to an accident. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, roadworks on the A1 by Highgate Station at the Woodman Traffic Lights. Water main works causing delays on the A1 in both directions into Highgate. A406 queuing southbound from the Barking Flyover down to the A13 at Beckton. Uh, the Euston Road, problems with the traffic lights just after Euston Station, causing delays back through the Euston underpass and back to Grayson Road westbound. There's also been an accident on Camden Road southbound at Hill Drop Road. That's the A503 Camden Road uh, southbound. On the Tubes, Metropolitan Line suspended between Harrow on the Hill and Uxbridge and no Piccadilly Line between South Harrow and Uxbridge, both of those due to a signal failure. Uh, no southern service between Clapham Junction and Milton Keynes Central due to staff shortage likely to be ongoing all day. And the Thames Cable Car has no service between Royal Docks and Greenwich Peninsula due to the high winds. Louise Pepper, BBC London, 94.9. Next update just before 12. BBC London, 94.9. London's news, London's stories. Call 020 722 4000. This is the last half hour of the lovely listener special and the greatest thing about the whole thing of course is that Robert Elms has finally appeared which is the moment everybody's been waiting for um, and he joins me. Robert you can hear me so it's alright, don't worry about it. Uh, he, can't, he can't hear through his headphones but it's okay. Um, this is the bit where we normally say, I say and after this we'll find out what's coming up on Robert's show. And one of our listeners here said 
what is it that you that you whisper to each other beforehand that sometimes you do talk about the subjects and sometimes you don't I don't know if there's, there's no... It seems to me that it's an entirely natural process, that some days you know it's a subject that I'll be interested in or I'll have an opinion on, yeah. obviously, and inevitably. Um, and occasionally it might not be. And occasionally, as well, I might have been not listening. Because sometimes... <laughs> oh, oh, how <laughs> could you say that? I'm it rooted. doesn't happen very I'm often, but every now quick. and then oh. I've got stuff to listen to before my show, which precludes me listening to you. So occasionally I will come in and say, I don't know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, he does. That's probably it. It's more that than anything else. There's nothing sort of... But um, usually... I've got, you know, I'm intrigued by what you have to say. And I also, without, you know, wanting to get too, you know, backslapping about this, I couldn't do your job, I don't think. Because what you do have is a degree of... Not that I don't have empathy, but you're so good at doing that personal stuff. And when people are in difficult That's situations, true. I'd end up in tears every day. Because he I, is, I, he's a real cry. I'm very he's quick, a terrible to, I'm, cry. I'm quick to tears. And I get very emotional. And I think the fact that you can hold it together when you have those really intense days... Most, most of the time. Most of the time. the time. They don't happen that often, but when they do, they're very, very intense. And you're fantastic at it. And I would be... I'd be in flood, so I'd be completely useless in that, in that sort well, of situation. Well, I just always think, well, this is my job, so I mean, if I'm going to do this, the snivelling, sometimes I can't hold it back. Usually I do, but, but usually sometimes I do it later when I get home, because yeah. sometimes it does... It is... I mean, truthfully, it can be it very can be involving. Very I mean, there's one call that we had not that long ago about this guy who'd just gone to a, a food... Bank. Did you hear that one? I think and it was I, just, yeah, I did. And he, and I he did. was. The thing that got me was he was so grateful and he was so sweet natured. This guy and he and he talked about how he'd got it, got into that situation, which essentially he'd lost a job and he hadn't been able to get another one. Then he'd become ill and whatever it was. And and he, and he talked about the food that he'd been given at this food bank and it was you know a packet of cereal, you know, a packet of biscuits, whatever. And then he said, and the best part about the whole thing was that he got this big hug from a very nice lady at the thing who, you know, made him feel nice about it. So he didn't feel horrible. He felt, he felt nice. And he felt, you know, he, he, felt, he felt that it was a, you know, a, a, altogether a fantastically lucky thing that he'd been able to go to this food bank and get the food. Well, I and it wasn't for me to start crying, was no, it? No, it wasn't. And I think but one of the things... I just felt, oh, One boy. of the things that your show does, and, and I hope as well my show does, is it, it belies the, the notion that people ring up radio shows to talk rubbish. Oh, yeah. Um, because you, you often get this sort of idea floating around the middle, oh, phoning calls, it's all just, you know, people complaining about dog's mess, or it's this and this. Well, it isn't. No. And it really, really isn't. I mean, the level of intelligence, the level of knowledge, the level of empathy, whatever it might be, that is shared from the listeners to both of us oh, in definitely. different ways. I mean, my stuff tends to be more upbeat and things that they're excited about and happy about and, mm. and can get, you know... And it's wonderful, and they're incredibly knowledgeable. We do things like, you know, cover to cover where people ring up and they know everything about a song, or, or we do notes and queries, and people's level of information is just phenomenal. Mm. And, and I think that's one of the things that, I don't know whether we're, there's a filtering system, that, but we seem to have great, you call well, them lovely listeners. That's why they're lovely listeners, because they we are have lovely great. listeners, intelligent listeners, we entertaining do. listeners, all of those things. And it just makes your job so much easier. Very true. I think. So on that note, what's coming up on your show today, Robert? Well, they've just written some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's Christmas, right? <laughs> uh, we've got Ray Gelato coming in to play live. Now, Ray oh, is one of my favourite kind of London musicians, and he's very much a London boy of Italian extraction. He's, he, every year he plays up at Ronnie Scott's for a Christmas kind of season, and he's going to come in and he'll do a couple of Christmas numbers for us, and he's absolutely brilliant. And we've also got a listed Londoner. Sometimes the listed Londoners are famous, sometimes they're not, and I think this one falls into the latter category. He's an artist called Gordon Robert McHaig III, and I think the third bit is probably important. <laughs> um, but the reason, one of the things is, he's involved in a campaign to try and get a statue for Joe Strummer, who died today, mm. on this day. And he has a gallery down under the Westway, which was very much Joe's terrain and very much my family's terrain. So that part of the world is very important to me. I, and Joe Strummer was very important to me. I've known Joe for many, many years. And so we're going to be talking about that. And it's sort of Joe Strummer Day on the show today. So that's, that's roughly what we're going to be doing. Plus, it's Christmas. So we'll knock about with some Christmas ideas and have some fun of what, what people are going to be doing over the festive season. Fantastic to see you, Robert. And he's got to rush back over to the studio now. So loads of love, Robert. Big kiss. Thank you very much. I want to get a warm response. You just say the word Robert Elms in London and that's all that matters. David Ealing says, I remember listening to Alex Lester on Radio T's in the 80s. Always has been tremendous. I was there from 1983 to 1986. And again, it was one of these the northeast of England. How are they going to cope with a bloke from Walsall? And it was great fun. <laughs> and it was terrific. We did all sorts of things. And we were again, and that was the thing. There was a freedom to go. I remember, I remember we had an American programme director and... Uh, 
you know, people always thought, oh, American radio, amazing. But he realised that it was Britain and it was the northeast of England, and so therefore it's not the same mm -hmm. as Milwaukee mm -hmm. or New York. No. And this is what a lot of programmers, you hear it around the country, make that mistake of thinking Britain is like, if we do what the Americans or the Australians do, it'll be a big success, and it wasn't. And I remember I turned up on the first day, I said, what's the sort of, um, you know, uh, how should I pitch it? And he just about said, up. <laughs> and that's all I needed to know. And so therefore he just said, are you having fun? Because if you're having fun, the listeners will have a good time. Let's bring Petrick on this. I well, I, I think you make a really interesting point there about, you know, the, the guy saying, you know, different parts of England are different. And clearly, BBC London's going to sound very different to Radio Cornwall, where I, where I grew up, for example. But I think that is one of the things that the BBC has kept faith with, that the commercial sector's effectively abandoned. I did a bit of work early in my career for a station called Plymouth Sound, which had an enormous audience down in Plymouth. We used to do a daily two-hour phone-in on which the subject of dog muck on Plymouth Ho was normally the lead topic week in week out but it was absolutely kind of linked to to the local area and had an enormous audience now it's part of some group i won't say which one they play a formulated list of music they do a local program in the morning the rest of it comes out of high wickham or birmingham or somewhere like that and that's happened right across commercial radio in the uk london there's a tiny bit of variety in the offer but it's not huge compared to what it was 10 or 15 years ago which makes what you're doing even more important i think and what bbc radio is doing right across the board of actually still providing something that isn't just bland, that isn't just kind of spooned out to, then, to an audience who are expected to and, like and it. And there have been these standout days. I mean, you know, when we were broadcasting, first of all, when, when we had this successful Olympic bid, which was the most brilliant, exhilarating, magnificent broadcasting day, and then the very next day was 7-7, seven, seven, and that day, um, you know, Londoners didn't know whether their, their, their nearest and dearest had, had survived the trip to work. I mean, literally, is, is, I'm not overstating it, that really was the truth. And the phones went down, do you remember? Yeah. And, and there was no way of communicating. You couldn't find out how anybody was or whether they were coming home. And, and do you remember lots of people walked home all the way from central London, however far, walked miles and miles home, arrived hours and hours late. And there were two days that defined London. They were. They? And what it meant to be a Londoner, whether, That's you know, right. like Robert Elms, you were absolutely of the city or whether you were someone who'd, who'd been here for, to go back to your earlier conversation, who'd been here for six months That's or something. Right, you know, absolutely. It, it brought people together as long and, and, and local radio at that point was really the only it was the arterial connection between people it was the only one there wasn't anything else and that was an extraordinary uh, amazing day to be to be part of it and in fact you know I, I mean I, I remember arriving about three four hours before my show just because I felt well I'll, I'll get to the BBC and if they need me to do anything you know and everyone else had done the same thing and we were all there ready to sort of be deployed and it was a very very uh, if, you, if you think about it the, the the tone of the broadcast had to be a very specific theme because you didn't want to alarm anyone at all all. It mustn't be over dramatic, absolutely not. But on the other hand, you mustn't be falsely calming either. You had to be accurate. The, the information coming in had to be very carefully sifted before you could give it out. It was it was this very delicate sort of balance of broadcasting in, in order to be the most helpful you could be and the least agitating you could be in an extremely tense and completely unprecedented situation. It was really something amazing, I, I, I thought. And I'm very, I'm very grateful to, to have been part of something like that because it was extraordinary broadcasting really um let's let's talk to the listeners Mandy. um yeah elaine that you contacted you earlier more or less said what i was going to say but i feel like this kind of station is like a companion and you know you it can prevent you from being lonely you can take part if you want to or you can just listen um i learn about events that are on places i've never been to so Television doesn't really do it for me because you've got, like somebody else said, you've got to sit down and concentrate. I can have the radio on wherever I am and pick up information, join in if I want to. And it, it just, you know, helps me lift my spirits. And sometimes you feel that whatever it is you've just been through or about to go through, mm -hmm. you're not the only person, which is, yeah. which is also a nice yeah. feeling. You can, you can be feeling very isolated in, in all sorts of things, even if it's something as kind of normal as, you know, for example, empty nest syndrome. You know, I remember coming in the day my, my, my littlest went off to, um, in fact, she went off for a year abroad first and then university, and I, I had been the person at Stansted Airport screaming as she went through the barrier, I love you more than any other mother at this airport loves their child, to which she gave me a look of complete disgust and dis 
disappeared through the, through the thing. And I came in the next day and I said, oh, empty nest, oh, no, what am I going to do? I just sit there in the empty bedroom staring at the bed. And, and, and loads of listeners rang in and said, ah, oh, they'll be back. They boomerang and boy, they did come back. She's still, I, living, still living at home now. That's what, I, that's what I love, you see. It's not us here to help you. Yes. You're here to help <laughs> That's us. the way I look at it, a, a whole selection of wonderfully, woefully inadequate people that <laughs> paraded on your radio <laughs> for you to help out. Thank so you true. very much. So true. Let's bring in Scott. Hi, Scott. Oh, hi. Um, well, it's just really... I mean, I've known you forever, as you know. You've never seen him before, but known him forever, no. yeah. Um, and um, it's really what it says on the tin. I mean... Um, it's all about BBC London, and when I moved over to Beijing, um, I could still get you there. Amazing. And now I've um, uh, deserted you once again. Yeah. And um, you did say to me, that, like, um, don't you dare desert us, so and don't here I am. Us. And here he is, which is brilliant. When you were in Beijing and you were listening to BBC London, how weird was that? It, was, it felt like I was in the way, but, like, I could understand exactly what was going on back home. Yes. I mean, for example, you you done a... Um, one piece on like Paul chocolate. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. And like um, I, I reached for the cabinet and like uh, it was nothing like Paul chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's go to James on the London Catford. Hi, James. You love radio. Hello, Vanessa. You, uh, well, I love BBC Radio London. I mean, the conversations you have with your callers, uh, they never cease to uh, amaze me. And uh, I remember when I first phoned up, Vanessa, I first spoke to you, I was, I was a bag of nerves. I was all shaky and flaky and. And, uh, I mean, you put me way at ease, and, you know, where, where else can you listen to someone quoting Milton and Byron? Yeah, I got Shakespeare zero reaction things. from the audience this morning when I gave him a darkness visible, nothing. Yeah. Schneola. Oh, I love that. Nothing. I love that. And your, your callers are amazing for this. Do you remember that time when um, your caller phoned up, Paul from Ilford, and we all recognised his voice, and he'd give a different name? <laughs> yes, I and do. Like, Hold on, we don't know who that guy is. That's not Ray from Shrek. <laughs> I was, I was, I had a pull over. I was absolutely crying with laughter. <laughs> I do remember I, it very clearly. No one can pull the wool over our eyes with these false names and um, locations. Not. Definitely not. And what about all the things that have been going on in your life then, all, all, all the time you've been ringing in, James? Oh well, this is like since she was in the afternoons. I mean, when you first died, I've, my boys have got older. That's right. Um, I've got. Yeah, I've got married, I've got divorced, I'm with someone new, and I've got my flat. You know, life's great, things are great. I mean, you, you guys have carried me through some times where I've been really down and miserable, but there's always someone that will cheer me up, someone who phone in, who will lift my spirits. The way you can deal with people, Vanessa, is that it's, it's second to none. I mean, Rob Elm, is, is, he's just wonderful as well. He gets me through the afternoons. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't go a week without listening to you guys. I really couldn't. It, it fills my... It makes, it makes my day. It lifts my day. Well, it's very kind of you to say so. And you know we feel exactly the same about you. And you know that is the absolute gospel truth. Because without you, what are we going to do? I'm going to be reciting the multiplication table to myself, uh, which very, would be bad. And uh, this is Alex Lester from Radio 2. It's very interesting that, again, the caller talking about that you're there. It's, it's actually, you know, who are you going to call Ghostbusters? Who are you going to call BBC London? Yes. And uh, because it's all, we're, all to, we're all in it together. And I remember, um, I think it was Radio... BBC Radio Stoke on Trent many years ago when they're sort of mid morning. Around. I have actually. I have been around a long time. In about 22 different stations by now. Wow. With an act like mine, you've got to keep moving. <laughs> and, the, and the whole thing is that there was a phone call. The chap phoned up, said on the phone, and you know, hello, hello. Uh, what we know is like an open line. What do you want to talk about? Oh, I wonder if someone could uh, give me a hand. I said, well, what's the problem? Um, I'm trapped under my wardrobe. <laughs> And apparently, it wasn't me that, that, that took this call, but apparently he'd been shifting some furniture and his wardrobe had fallen on him, but he had the phone to hand. Now, if you're, you know, if you're being crushed by a wardrobe, the first thing you do is phone your radio station, isn't it? You know, you go, let's phone the police or for a, a neighbour or something like that. Nope, I'll phone the radio station. They'll know exactly what to do, and which is great. We'll be back straight after this trail. Four good reasons to spend Christmas Day with BBC London 94.9. So this is the big reveal. Double take care of playing with his nose in the field of cabbages. You what? You what? For a better los niños. What does that mean? Get in spirit early with Jamoke from Six. Good morning and happy Christmas. Happy Christmas to you to Get dancing with Simon and Joe from Nine. Will you manage your Batman solo coup to PA? I think so. Two. Oh. Get soulful with another chance to hear Tony Blackburn's Big Soul Night Out from midday. Give yourselves a round of applause. That was fantastic. It was a fantastic night. We had an amazing time. It was a happy, happy event. Get time to reflect. You women must go on. Stories from London 
Times Past in World War One at Home. Not until you drop, because you mustn't drop. Plus the Christmas truce, all from four. In Spirit with Jim Moke, Simon and Joe, Tony Blackburn's Big Soul Night Out, and World War One at Home. Best present ever. You are fantastic. Oh, for good reasons to spend Christmas Day with BBC London 94.9. And this is from Paul in Crystal Palace. He says, Vanessa, can I just say what a wonderful idea the listener special is. I'm a member of the old lag, some of whom I believe are in your audience at this very moment, enjoying the BBC croissant. One of them can explain what the old lags group is. Anyone here from the old lags? Yes. Yes. What is the old lags? Uh, lags... Uh, it's an acronym. It's yeah. Letterman and Good Shows. We're fans. We're a thousand strong. Wow. And we're fans of those two shows. Welcome. Uh, and he says, um, some of us attended Joan from Wellington's funeral earlier this year, and I'm sure that she would have loved the show this morning. And I just very quickly, this is from um, Geraldine Rose, who says, um, could you please let me have the details of how to cook a turkey Joan's way? What temperature? And for how long? Love your program and love Joan's contribution. She shall not be forgotten. Now, look, I did use Joan's recipe last year, but do I know the temperature? temperature and how long. I mean, it depends on the size of the turkey apart from anything else. The, all I can tell you is the technique, and this is the technique. This is what Joan said, and it worked brilliantly for me with my kosher turkey from the kosher turkey farm in Hendon last Christmas. And that is multiculturalism to the max, don't you think? Absolutely living the dream. And uh, what Joan said is you take your foil you spread your foil out on the work surface in front of you. You take your baking tray with your turkey in it and whatever moisture you're adding to the turkey by whatever means. And then you make a massive pyramid of the foil which encompasses the baking tray and the turkey within it. You start with the turkey upside down and that way you make almost like a turkey Turkish bath that there's moisture kind of embalming and in, in, I don't know what you call it, moisture fizzing around the turkey for the entire duration of the cooking. You then turn it over but you keep you you, you know you replace the turkey pure i'm doing the actions i really am doing the actions here now if only you could see this and then when it comes to the last bit you turn it the right way up and then you you get it all brown and crispy and lovely possibly pouring some honey or something over it at the, at the last minute that is the late joan in wallington's recipe for doing a turkey and it i tried it and it worked for me incredibly well so thank you for asking let's go to Oh, hello, it's David here from David Twickenham again. David again in Twickenham. Hi, David. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm a bit obsessed. This station is the soundtrack to my life, has been for a very long time. I've got radios in the bathroom, the kitchen and the living room, all different ones, and they're all on the station all the time, so I don't miss anything. I have a little business in Twickenham as well, and I'd like to say to all my clients, if you call me around about 10 to 12 on most days, I will look at it quizzically and go, no, I can't answer it, because I've got to wait to see what Robert's going to say when he comes into <laughs> Vanessa. And they have that little chat at the end of the show. So, um, you know, thank you, Vanessa. It's a, it's a wonderful show. You're, and we were just saying earlier that one of the things we like about you is uh, you, don't, you don't try and dumb down. You let your vocabulary through and your articulacy. Um, and it's just a fantastic, uh, challenging show, and we love it, and we love you. Thank you very much, Josh. I was already a bit swollen headed after this Hall of Fame thing. I'm going to be absolutely insufferable. I believe every word of my own hype, and I think I'm a complete genius. Let's go to this lady here. What's your name? Judy. Judy. Uh, radio now has become quite poignant for me. Many years ago, almost in the Middle Ages, I actually did a children's radio show. I was doing, I was doing a, a television shows and radio shows at the same time. And I loved what you were saying before. I loved the spontaneity of working on the radio. And quite often, the programme was almost led by the children because there was a sort of sense of freedom you got. They'd send an ideas, and you'd think, yeah, great idea for a show. Now, at this end of my life, um, it's become my great companion and your huge company for me. And just like the previous person who spoke, I've got radios everywhere, and my day wouldn't be the same without oh, radio thank you. What was the name of the show that you used to present? This was actually not here. It was in New Zealand. And what was it called? Um, uh, <laughs> just the children's hour. Yes. Um, on a sort of what the New Zealand equivalent was of, of Radio 4. Uh -huh. And I did three children's programmes. I did... Um, God, it's a long time ago. <laughs> um, Judy Ann and the Fang Family, yes. which I did with puppets. Yeah. Playtime with Judy Ann, which was a preschoolers program. Yeah. And another program called Junior Magazine, which I didn't know at the time was almost the same as Blue Peter. Wow. And I came over here for a holiday. We're talking about the 70s yeah. here, so we were talking about almost the Middle Ages. Uh -huh. And I um, sat in the studio while they were doing Blue Peter in the days of Valerie Singleton and that crew. So it's all sort of come full circle. And here I am now living in England and absolutely loving Radio London. Well, thank you very much indeed. That's really very kind of you. Thank you. 
comes Dresden. I grew up with radio from being a child through to being an adult and have loved radio all the time. And like Paul, I have a radio in every room and I can hear BBC Radio London and every, every, everywhere I go. But even when I've worked away and I've been in Manchester for two years, I would listen to Radio London every day. I go to New York. I will at least check in to make sure that BBC Radio London is still there doing its stuff. I love it. I tell you, our boss is over there at the back, the smile on his I've never seen him smile so much in all these years. He's never been known to make a fair expression on his face or a grin of Cheshire Cat proportions. Let's go to Maureen in plaster. Well, we all love you, Vanessa, because you are just natural. You're a friend. And if I say any more, I get upset. Oh, <laughs> oh gosh. And I know Patrick wanted to talk a little bit about what he sees the future of radio. Well, I, I was just going to say that here we are in this kind of very smart room in BBC Broadcasting House that was built as a home for radio. Lord Reith, the man who founded the BBC, is bearing down upon us. And when the BBC started, it was all about radio. Then television came along. And I think in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, there was a real feeling from the kind of whiz kids in the organisation that TV was going to be the thing and radio would probably just just go out of fashion, wither and die. But actually, it seems to me maybe it's the other way around. I mean, BBC Three is going to stop being a traditional channel. You'll download individual programmes. I suspect within our lifetimes that'll happen to all the television networks and we'll pick and choose what we want from television. But radio is a live kind of linear stream force of programmes with live shows like yours, with classical music, with Alex doing his stuff. I think that'll live on because we kind of want it and we need it. And, and, and it has that role in our life that television doesn't necessarily necessarily have. So I think the future is actually incredibly bright. Don't you radio. think it's astounding though because as a nation we've taken so much to texting. And when you ask people, you know, do you text, do you email? And they, they will say yes because I don't want to have a whole phone call. I can't be able to actually speak to someone. And also they might say something I disagree with which would be a nightmare. So I just leave a message or send a text. And, and yet on radio, that's not it. It's, it's something else, Alex, that's, that's happening, isn't it? I, I think it's... Um the radio will always exist in some form. The, the, the method of delivery may change because Petron was talking about downloading stuff and now there's lots of little stations all over, sort of the DAB and all this, and there's lots of niche stations and things like that. So I think also there's a time, I think, where you can, you can now start downloading uh, radio programmes as well. So I think, you know, the method of delivery, but the thing that we have in our favour is, as you've mentioned earlier, the audience has mentioned earlier, you can do other stuff while we're on, uh, which means you're holding... Cause you remember 1982? I remember talking to Michael Parkinson. They were just setting up TVAM, and the, the radio industry was terrified. I was in commercial radio at that time. The radio industry was terrified that it would just wipe out the radio. Mm. Breakfast radio would vanish. Well, it hasn't. Who won has, that battle? Who won that battle, exactly. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I'd just like to thank everybody so much for today. This is our first ever lovely listener special. I have the feeling it won't be our last, because this has been absolutely delightful to, to see you all, to put faces to the voices after all these years. It's been so many years, and it's really um, amazing to see you. I can't thank you enough for, for coming in. I want to thank um, our special guests, uh, Petrock Jelani, thank you so much, Alex Lester, um, and thanks very much to Frank Gardner as well, and, and also wonderful Robert Elms, who made the trek over here to see everybody. They were thrilled to see him in the flesh. Thanks to our boss for welcoming everybody so beautifully today, and to Gemma, uh, my producer, for putting the whole thing together and really masterminding it so beautifully. Thank you very much. And also the whole technical team for getting it on the, on the, um, on the air to you. Daminda and Egham and Maureen Aplasto for editing the show extremely well. And thanks to everybody who made this possible. I do hope you have a fabulous evening. Robert's coming up with, as you heard, a tremendous show. And I will see you in the morning. Lots of love. Bye-bye. <laughs>